I'm Byron Joyner, Associate Dean for Graduate Medical Education, and I'm, it's an honor for me to be here and to co-host with uh, Dr. Brian Ross from Anesthesia. Medicine is becoming more of a team sport. We are actually having to work in interprofessional and interdisciplinary teams, and I'm thinking that you're going to see that tonight with the two guests that we have. Tonight, Drs. Jean Poole and April Stimpian Otero will demonstrate the teamwork in cardiology and their presentation, which is entitled, When Your Heart Needs to Help Cardiac Interventions and Repair, will demonstrate this with some surprise that they have for us. Jean Poole is the Professor of Medicine in the Division of Cardiology, and she's also Director of the Arrhythmia Service and Electrophysiology at the University of Washington Medical Center. Dr. Poole sees patients with a broad spectrum of heart rhythm abnormalities and symptoms. She surgically implants pacemakers and heart defibrillators, and implantable cardioverter defibrillators, and has been involved in some of the nation's largest and most comprehensive studies of ICDs used to prevent sudden death in patients. She directs the Clinical Cardiac Electrophysiology Program, training advanced fellows in the field of electrophysiology and cardiac arrhythmias. Dr. Poole earned her medical degree and performed her residency in cardiology fellowship here at the University of Washington School of Medicine. She did her internship at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. She enjoys spending time with her family. Here she is skiing in Breckenridge, Colorado with her son and two daughters. Our second speaker tonight is April Stampion Otero. She is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology. She is the Craig and Julie Tall Endowed Professor uh, for Heart Failure Research. She's also an attending physician here at the University of Washington Medical Center where she cares for patients with end-stage heart failure before and after cardiac transplantation. Her research, in conjunction with the University of Washington Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine, is focused on the role of bone marrow-derived cells in cardiac repair and regeneration. She earned her medical degree from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine in Farmington, Connecticut. Dr. Stampin Otero did her internship and residency at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, where she was chief resident. She completed a cardiology fellowship at the University of Washington and joined the faculty here in 1997. She received an outstanding CME teacher award from the University of Washington School of Medicine and has been named among the best doctors in America since 2002. A strong advocate for women's cardiovascular health, Dr. Stampin Otero founded the Local Women in Heart Disease Initiative for the American Heart Association. Dr. Stampin Otero and her friend Sherry are working moms who believe that real food is the real prescription for healthy and happy lives. Knowing how challenging it is to prepare meals when you're busy, they've developed a blog, crunchtimefood.com, where they share ideas about making real food fast. The schedule tonight is going to be a somewhat of a tag team approach. First, Dr. Stampin Otero will briefly discuss the issues of heart failure. Then Dr. Poole will uh, make a presentation on implantable devices. Then we're going to have a surprise guest, one of their patients, which will be very interesting, I'm sure. Tonight, we're going to talk about heart failure as a disease process and what we do to repair and regenerate the heart. We're going to talk about the limitations of heart failure medications, and then Dr. Poole is going to talk about the electrical system of the heart and what can go wrong in patients with heart failure and other heart diseases. Then I'm going to focus on the pumping part of the heart and talk about left ventricular assist devices and then talk about some of the studies we're doing to ultimately permanently repair the pump. So what is heart failure? Well, heart failure isn't necessarily a diagnosis of a disease. It's rather the name of a syndrome in which somebody gets shortness of breath and swelling or edema due to inability of the heart to pump blood forward. It is 
caused by many things in cardiology. It's caused by ischemic heart disease, high blood pressure, and cardiomyopathy, which means weak heart muscle, basically, in Latin. And that's a range of genetic cause and valvular causes of heart disease. It's the common final pathway for almost all diseases. Anybody with extensive heart disease for a long period of time ends up with heart failure as their heart deteriorates. It's extremely common because of that. And 9% of men between the ages of 60 and 79 and 5% of women carry the diagnosis of heart failure with increasing numbers every year. You can imagine with the baby boomers hitting 60, we're getting to a huge group of people with heart failure. And it is currently the number one Medicare discharge diagnosis. So of all the diagnoses of patients on Medicare in the country, heart failure is the number one, costing an estimated $39 billion yearly. We define heart failure by the severity of the symptoms, and we use this classification called the New York Heart Association classification system. And New York Heart Association class one patients may have a horrible heart function, but they essentially have no symptoms. New York Heart Association class two patients have symptoms with significant exertion. And when I ask patients in clinic, it's really usually, can you walk up two flights of stairs? And if they can, I put them in class two. And they say, well, I get short of breath at the top. Class three patients are patients who get short of breath with less exertion. So if they walk up one flight of stairs, if they try and carry groceries in from this, the car, they have to stop and get short of breath and rest because of shortness of breath. Class four patients have symptoms at rest. Those are the people that even just if they start talking vigorously, they become short of breath. So the good news about heart failure is that we made dramatic progress from the late 80s through the late 90s in drug or pharmacologic therapy. Here you can see two major trials that bookend this. The consensus trial was in 1987, and this was actually the first trial where there was a medicine that, that helped patients with heart failure live longer, and that medicine was enalapril, which I prescribe because it rhymes with April. Um, <laughs> And in the consensus trial, you can see here patients with very symptomatic heart failure who got placebo or no therapy, almost 70% of them were dead at one year. As opposed to the patients who got the therapy, it dropped it to 45%. So a significant reduction and improvement in survival was the first time we saw this. By 2000, we had upped the doses of these drugs, ACE inhibitors in patients, dramatically. And we had started adding in beta blocker therapy and other therapies. And by 2000, actually, patients on routine therapy with symptoms had only a 20% risk of dying at one year. And with the best possible therapy, the addition of beta blockers, that risk dropped even further. So by the turn of the century, we had made great, great strides in reducing mortality from heart failure with pharmacologic therapies. But essentially, it, it ground to a halt at that point. There have been no new drugs developed that improve mortality for heart failure since the 1990s. We've reused a couple of old ones, but there have been no new drug development. Instead, the aughts, as I call them, have been the decade of developing devices for heart failure. So, very complex technology that's improved mortality. Because of this complex te um, technology, heart failure management now requires a collaboration of a group of people. It's no longer just one cardiologist prescribing drugs. We have cardiologists who have special training in heart failure. You know, general cardiologists see a lot of heart failure, but patient cardiologists who just see heart failure develop an expertise in this. We have cardiologists with special training in the management of the arrhythmias that occur with heart failure, and Dr. Poole is one of those electrophysiologists. The cardiac surgeons, as you'll see later on, become quite involved. And I think the most important group that deserves mention and everyone needs to remember is the specialized healthcare pro professionals, the nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, and, and doctors of pharmacy that help us in the day-to-day -day management of these patients. So at this point, we're going to talk, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Poole, who's going to present a patient case. And in medical school, for any of you who've been to medical school, or any sort of thing, we frequently frame a discussion of a disease with a patient case so that everyone can really connect with it. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Joyner, Ross, and all of you for coming out tonight. I hear the weather is pretty horrible out there. I don't know, because I haven't seen or looked outside yet today. But I'm going to take this now and talk about what goes wrong with heart rhythms in patients who have heart failure. So to begin, we're going to talk about a patient case. 
So we have a 41-year-old male who has heart failure. He was diagnosed in the year 2001 and treated with good heart failure medications and did pretty well, continued with New York Heart Association class two and three heart failure symptoms. But something went wrong in spring of 2004. This patient had sudden cardiac arrest. Sometimes it's called sudden cardiac death, but since not everybody fortunately dies from this, I'll refer to this as sudden cardiac arrest. There's a lot of confusion about what a cardiac arrest is. Frequently you'll hear of somebody who died suddenly and it's termed a heart attack. Well, that may be true, but it often is not really what happened. So let's talk about what a heart attack is first to make sure everybody un understands that. Heart attack has to do with the plumbing of the heart, the blood vessels. And what you can see on this figure are the main coronary arteries. They came off of the aorta, and there's the right coronary artery, and the left coronary artery, which quickly branches into two vessels, the left anterior descending artery and the left circumflex artery. So a heart attack happens when a blood clot forms acutely in one of the arteries and blocks the blood flow to that part of the heart muscle that that blood vessel was supplying. So if that cannot be acutely opened up with percutaneous coronary intervention or with a clot-busting drug such as TPA or streptokinase, that part of the heart muscle will die and turn into scar tissue. So what is sudden cardiac arrest? Well, in most cases, it is a rapid, life-threatening cardiac arrhythmia that interrupts the pumping function of the heart. That results in no pulse, no blood pressure, and no breathing. So to understand when the electricity goes awry in the heart, we first have to look at what the normal electrical pattern of the heart is. I'm an electrophysiologist, that is an electrician of the heart. So I think the electrical system of the heart is actually the most important because without electricity, there is no pumping of the heart. So the heart's a pretty amazing organ. So there are a group of myocardial cells up in the top chamber, the right atrium of the heart, designated the sinus node. And these heart muscle cells spontaneously depolarize. That is, they create electricity all by themselves. And they do so for your whole life at anywhere from about 60 to 100 beats per minute or higher if you need to, such as with exercise or when you have a fever. This electricity then flows through the upper chambers of the heart, but to get to the bottom of the heart, the electricity goes through a center portion of the heart termed the AV node, and then conducts down some superhighways called bundle branches. These are not blood vessels. They're just super electrical conducting cells. And from there, the electricity spreads out into the working myocardium, and that's what causes the heartbeat. That's what causes your pulse. On an electrocardiogram, you'll see the result of the electricity flowing through your heart and we term them different kinds of waves. So you'll see what's called a P wave, and that represents the electrical conduction through the upper chambers of the heart. Then that's followed by the large signal called the QRS complex. That represents the electrical conduction through the working myocardium of the heart, followed by the T wave, which is the electrical resetting of the heart. So that's normal. What does a normal heartbeat look like on a regular standard electrocardiogram? What's well, a nice, regular standard rhythm, and you see P wave, a QRS complex, and a T wave. And again, normal resting heart rate can be anywhere from about 50 up to 100 beats per minute. So let's come back to sudden cardiac arrest. What is it? It's a rapid, chaotic, abnormal rhythm from the ventricles, the bottom chambers of the heart, that we call ventricular fibrillation. This is what it looks like, chaotic, disorganized, very different from the normal heart rhythm. Think of it like an electrical short circuit going through the heart. The only way to stop this rhythm is to shock it with a defibrillator. A smaller proportion of patients can be found in a more organized rhythm in the setting of cardiac arrest. This rhythm is called pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Pulseless because ventricular tachycardia is actually quite a common rhythm that patients with heart disease have, and not all patients will have a cardiac arrest. You can see that it's much more organized and regular, but fast compared to the chaotic ventricular fibrillation. Even less common patients can have cardiac arrest due to a heartbeat that is too slow. Well, how does that happen? Well, one of the most common reasons is there's a block through that AV node or down those bundle branches. So here's a QRS complex. Here's a P wave. It should be followed by another QRS complex, but it's not. Here's another P wave. 
This one then conducts. But overall, the heart rate is very slow. In this instance, about 25 beats per minute. Not really fast enough to support an adequate blood pressure. And in the setting of somebody with a poor heart function, they may have sudden collapse or a cardiac arrest. So before we get to treating ventricular fibrillation, or rhythms that go too fast, you need to understand what we do for rhythms that go too slow. Well, we can implant a pacemaker. Well, what is a pacemaker? Pacemaker is a pulse generator that has the electronics and can deliver an electronic stimulus down wires. We call them leads. One or two leads will be placed into the right-sided chambers of the heart, in this example in the right atrium, and another one in the right ventricle. What will you see in an electrocardiogram? Well, if the patient does not have their own heartbeat, the pacemaker will take over. A little electronic signal is put down the wire that causes a contraction of the heart. However, if the patient has their own heartbeat, the pacemaker just sits in the background, it's inhibited, and waits, looking to see if the patient is going to have their own heartbeat. But if not, it will then stimulate the heart to contract. So that's how a pacemaker works. That's the fix for a heartbeat that is too slow. What does it look like inside the heart? Well, this is an x-ray of a patient that has a pacemaker implanted. In this case, the pacemaker generator is implanted under the skin up in the right upper chest. There's a single lead that is advanced through a vein underneath the collarbone, comes down into the heart, and sits inside the right ventricle. All right, let's get back to sudden cardiac arrest due to the most common rhythm, ventricular fibrillation. So here's our chaotic ventricular fibrillation rhythm. What happens if that is not shocked? Well, it goes to this rhythm. You may call that flat line. We call it asystole. It's a big difference because this rhythm is a shockable rhythm, BF, whereas this rhythm is not shockable. What's important about that? Well, we know that people who have sudden cardiac arrest in public places or in their homes, time is of the essence. It's the time from when they first collapse with ventricular fibrillation to receiving that life-saving shock that matters. And the time is in the matter of minutes. So survival decreases very rapidly as time passes, such that by about 10 to 15 minutes, if a patient has not been shocked back to a normal rhythm, their chance of survival is dismally low. How big of a problem is sudden cardiac arrest? It's big. So altogether, Cardiac death represents about a half a million deaths in the United States per year. It's the number two reason to die in the U.S., right behind all cancers lumped together. What about cardiac arrest? There are 300,000 cardiac arrests occurring in the United States every year that are attended to by an emergency medical system. It is the number three reason to die in the United States. That translates into 700 individuals every day who are victims of sudden cardiac arrest. Unfortunately, survival is poor. For all comers, survival ranges from about 3% up to about 16%. That's not a very good outcome. If, however, you can get to a patient quickly with a defibrillator shock, survival can be as high as 40%. So, for instance, in King County and in the surrounding areas, we can get to patients quickly. We have a good emergency medical system. So what kind of people are at risk for sudden cardiac arrest? Well, heart failure patients from any cause, patients with underlying coronary artery disease, especially those who've had a heart attack. Occasionally, people who are having a heart attack also can trigger ventricular fibrillation at the same time, a double bad whammy. Any abnormal cardiac muscle problem that's not related to coronary artery disease, we call that a cardiomyopathy. That can be idiopathic, meaning we don't know what caused it. It can run in families. It can be a result of cardiac valvular problems. It can be a result of a thickened heart. We call that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Or a more rare but important cause of sudden cardiac death, especially in young athletes, a rhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Also, there are individuals who have no structural abnormalities of the heart whatsoever. We call that a primary electrical abnormality. It's on the basis of an abnormal genetic disorder. These patients have an otherwise normal heart. You may be familiar with some of these abnormalities. They go by the terms long QT syndrome or Brugada syndrome. So what happens to a patient who's having a sudden cardiac arrest? Generally, there's sudden collapse with no warning whatsoever or few symptoms. If they do have symptoms, they may complain of shortness of breath, 
or chest heaviness, dizziness, nausea, or palpitations in the minutes prior to collapse. They may appear pale with labored or absent breathing. And this is important. Patients will often jerk, the kind of jerks that you get just as you're falling off to sleep because the brain is not getting enough blood. Unfortunately, that can be confused as a patient having a seizure. And if so, that can postpone life-saving resuscitation. So that's important to keep in mind because without help, there will be no breathing, no pulse, and survival is unlikely. How do we improve the outcomes from sudden cardiac arrest? Well, as I mentioned, we're fortunate to live in the area in which we do because we have a great emergency medical system that gets early defibrillation to patients. But it's very important for laypersons to also know what to do, to call 911 right away, to use an automatic external defibrillator if available, and to perform CPR. What do we physicians do when we see patients who have survived a cardiac arrest? Well, the most important thing is to figure out why they had it. So we need to identify whether or not they have underlying coronary disease, they've had an MI, they have heart failure, they have a cardiomyopathy, or they have a genetic primary electrical disorder. We need to place them on appropriate cardiac medications. And we need to implant a cardioverter defibrillator. Why? Because patients who survive out-of-hospital cardiac arrest are at the highest risk for a recurrent second episode. And we've learned that antiarrhythmic drugs or rhythm-controlling medications have not proven to be beneficial to prevent sudden cardiac arrest. Fortunately, the implantable cardioverted defibrillator was developed. Now, you may be surprised to know that this was actually first engineered back in the 1970s by three physicians, Morton Maurer, Art Moss, and Michelle Morawski. It took, however, until 1985 for the first FDA-approved device to be implanted into humans. The first devices were very large, and you'll get to see after our lecture tonight examples of that. We have toys up here on the table for you to come up and look at. But the first battery packs, or pulse generators, were so large they had to be implanted under the skin in the abdomen. There were wires that were then advanced up to the heart. The patient had to have their chest open with a sternotomy, like somebody having open heart surgery, where patches were sewn onto the heart, and then sensing electrodes were brought down and plugged into the battery pack. So if a patient went into a cardiac arrest, due to ventricular fibrillation or rapid ventricular tachycardia, a shock would be delivered between the two patches to restore the heart back to normal rhythm. By 1988, all defibrillators included pacemaker function also, so they could save patients from rhythms that were too slow, as well as rhythms that were too fast. By 1995, so just in 10 short years, these devices had improved to the point where the pulse generator was small enough that it could be implanted under the skin in the upper chest with a lead placed under the collarbone, just like a pacemaker, and into the heart. In this case, the lead has a coil at its base, and the shock is delivered between that coil and the actual can of the device to shock a patient from an abnormal rhythm back to normal. Well, we knew that they worked pretty well, and we were impressed with our early discoveries about defibrillators, but the real question was, is this the right thing to do? And should we ask our insurance companies and Medicare and Medicaid to pay for these devices as first-line therapy for patients who survived a cardiac arrest? Well, to answer those big kinds of questions, you need to do a randomized clinical trial. And the most important trial was a trial called AVID. It stands for the Antiarrhythmics versus Implantable Defibrillators that compared antiarrhythmic drug therapy to an implantable cardioverted defibrillator. This was supported by the NIH, so a good use of your tax dollars, and enrolled over 1,000 patients who had either had VF or pulses VT between 1993 and 1997. The patients were randomized to receive an ICD or an antiarrhythmic drug. The drugs that were chosen were the ones that were thought to be the best at the time, amiodarone or sotalol, and all-cause mortality was looked at. Now, you're going to see a lot of these sorts of survival curves. We call them Kaplan-Meier curves. So what is plotted here is the proportion of patients surviving over the course of time that the trial went on. So at the beginning of the trial, 100% of patients have survived in all groups. But over the course of time, as patients begin to die, we can compare the rate at which patients die between the two groups. And what we noted was the patients who had been randomized to the defibrillator group had a better survival and patients who were randomized to the antiarrhythmic drug group. And in fact, the reduction in all-cause mortality was 39% at one year and 31% at three years for patients who had been given an implantable cardioverted defibrillator. 
So this was really the most important trial that told us that the right therapy for survivors of sudden cardiac arrest was an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Well, what about patients who are at risk for sudden cardiac arrest? Who are these patients? Well, they're patients who have not had VT or VF and have heart failure, but we know are at risk for having one of those fatal arrhythmias at some time in the future. So it was clear that we needed another kind of a trial, a trial that would examine the question of using an ICD for what we call primary prevention or prophylactic use. To figure out who to study, we needed to look back at some of the other trials and understand a little bit better about heart failure patients and how they die. So these are pie graphs of cause of death from a trial called the Merit Heart Failure Trial. This was an important trial that examined one of the beta blocker drugs, metoprolol, for heart failure therapy. One of the interesting aspects of this trial was looking at what we call mode of death. So I have three pie charts. You can see that for the sickest patients, those who are New York Heart Association class four, the pie is biggest. That is, as expected, there were more deaths than in patients with New York Heart Association class two. But as a percentage of all deaths, patients with more modest heart failure were more likely to die of sudden death than patients with advanced heart failure who were more likely to die of progressive heart failure. So if you're going to examine the benefit of something that shocks the heart, you're going to want to look at it in patients who have less severe heart failure. Another way to think about this is to look at the rhythm at death. So as worsening heart failure progresses, patients are less likely to be found in a shockable rhythm and more likely to be found in a non-shockable rhythm. The single most important study that looked at ICDs as primary prevention was the sudden cardiac death in heart failure trial. This was a trial based out of the University of Washington, and several of us were involved as principal investigators in this trial. It was led by Dr. Gus Barty. I was a co-investigator, as was Dan Fishbein, who's one of the other heart failure physicians here at the University of Washington. This was a very large trial. It was conducted in 148 sites across the United States, Canada, and New Zealand. There were 2,521 patients enrolled in this trial. With all forms of heart failure, both what we call ischemic, that is having underlying coronary disease, and non-ischemic, they were randomized to three different therapies. One was a drug, amiodarone, because even though we knew that it was inferior to an ICD for survivors of cardiac arrest, we didn't know whether or not it would prove to be a successful drug at preventing cardiac arrest in patients at risk. So this was a drug studied in a blinded fashion, so patients didn't know if they were on the active drug or a placebo drug, and then the remaining third of patients were randomized to receive a defibrillator. To get into the trial, patients had to have what's called an ejection fraction of equal to or less than 35%. Now, an ejection fraction is the amount of blood that is ejected out of the heart with a single heartbeat, and normal is about 60%, so those people had about half their heart function. They had modest heart failure symptoms, that is, they were class two or three. We looked at the endpoint of all-cause mortality, very long follow-up, nearly four and a half to five years, and again, this was an NIH-sponsored trial. Now, this curve goes the opposite direction than the one I showed you earlier because it's plotting mortality over the time of the trial. So at the beginning of the trial, everybody's alive, but as the trial progresses, people start to die. The first comparison is the blue line, the amiodarone drug, compared to patients who were on the placebo drug. And there was no difference. You can see these lines overlap each other. That is, that amiodarone did not prevent patients from dying, and particularly did not prevent them from dying from sudden cardiac arrest. So although it's a useful medication for many rhythms, it wasn't useful to prevent this life-threatening arrhythmia. On the other hand, the implantable defibrillator decreased mortality compared to patients who were on placebo drug. Patients who received the ICD had a relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality of 23%. This was also the first study to examine the benefit of the ICD for all causes of heart failure. So here is the benefit of the ICD, the pink line compared to the placebo patients in the yellow, for those with coronary disease, and those with heart failure due to other causes, non-coronary disease. Overall, mortality is higher in those patients with underlying coronary disease than it is for those with other causes of heart failure, but the relative benefit, the difference in mortality between 
the ICD and the placebo arm of the trial was the same. And this was really critical information. Now, when you're examining the benefit of an ICD, you would expect that you would see along the course of the trial people being saved from ventricular fibrillation. And indeed, that's what we saw. And we saw a lot of it. So this is an example of a rhythm from a patient that was actually enrolled in the SCUD-HEF trial. This is their tracing. Here's nice, normal, regular rhythm. It starts to become perturbed, and the patient goes right into ventricular fibrillation. You can see that rapid, chaotic rhythm. They receive a shock, which restores them back to normal rhythm. So that was truly a life saved from the defibrillator. There were other important observations from this trial. I took a look at the patients who actually, over the course of time in this trial, had VT or VF. And we learned some important things about those patients, what their future risks were, and how to manage those patients better. Another one of our heart failure physicians here at the University of Washington, Dr. Wayne Levy, applied his Seattle heart failure model risk stratification to the scud have patients, again, to examine which patients are most likely to benefit from ICD therapy. Another very important sub-study of this trial was to look at the cost effectiveness of this particular therapy. People often wonder how expensive these devices are. They cost about $17,000 to $25,000. But when we think about whether it's worth spending that amount of money on a particular kind of therapy, we talk about it in terms of life years saved. So an ICD is associated with $33,000 that must be, so, must be spent to save a single life. Now, how does that compare to other things that we do? Well, the benchmark that we normally use is fifty dollars to $60,000 per life year saved we think is a good deal. And that comes from dialysis patients. It costs about $100,000 to save one life for patients on statin therapy for several decades. So actually, this is a very cost-efficient strategy, particularly when you think that most people will otherwise die from a cardiac arrest if they don't have a defibrillator. Also important was that following the scud have trial, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, reimbursed ICDs not only in coronary disease patients, but extended reimbursement for primary prevention of sudden death in eligible heart failure patients with and without coronary artery disease. Also, in the 2008 American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology and Heart Rhythm Society guidelines for device-based therapy of cardiac rhythm abnormalities, these guidelines assigned the highest recommendation, we call that a class one recommendation, for using ICDs to prevent sudden cardiac arrest in eligible patients. That is, patients with moderate heart failure, class 2 or 3, have an ejection fraction equal to or less than 35%. We like to encourage any patient who has heart disease to know your ejection fraction because you might be eligible for this life-saving therapy. How do we follow patients who have ICDs? Well, we see them back in our clinics, and we can talk to their devices with what we call a programmer. And this programmer makes a link to the device. And from that, we can print out information and we find out how the device is programmed. We can also see if the device has logged any abnormal rhythms or whether the patient received any therapy from the ICD. So here's a patient who came into clinic for a routine checkup. I've changed the colors on this to make it a little bit easier to see. Normally, it would be printed on a white paper. But this patient didn't know that he had had an event. But we found out about it by simply interrogating the device. So here's what the device saw. It picked up an abnormal fast rhythm. It assigns these marker channels. This is what the device calls the rhythm. It called it ventricular fibrillation, delivered a shock, and restored the patient back to normal rhythm. This occurred in the middle of the night. The patient was sleeping, didn't even know that this happened. That would have been most likely a death had this patient not had an ICD. For patients who have ventricular tachycardia, that more organized rhythm, very frequently, we can stop the rhythm in a painless method that is not using a shock. So here's a patient in ventricular tachycardia. And the way we do that is we use the pacemaker function of the device to pace even faster than the heart rate of the VT. Now, we'll often stop the rhythm and return it to normal rhythm in a painless fashion. All right, now I'm going to show you a five-minute video clip of how we implant a defibrillator. So I have brought about an, an hour and a half procedure down to five minutes. So this is a sterile surgical procedure. We're going to start with one of the physicians scrubbing their hands. And then you'll see the physicians going into our sterile procedure room wearing lead aprons because we use x-ray to help guide our catheters as we implant them into the, into the patient. 
This is the patient's head on this end, feet are down here. And we actually draw on the patient's skin to mark what we call landmarks. So this is the patient's clavicle. This is the space between their arm and their chest. And here we've marked where we're going to make the incision to make what we call a pocket. And a pocket is simply a space under the skin. We all have subcutaneous fat under our skin. Some of us have more than others. And so we can simply make a space that's above the muscle, the chest muscle, and underneath the skin that we're going to hide the pulse generator. Physicians noting the different landmarks and where they plan to make the incision. So he has now made the incision and created a pocket space. And he's going to show you that with a retractor lifting up. So that's the space we're going to hide the generator. Now, this is the lead. And what you're going to see is the end of the lead, and we'll get close-ups of it with wires that are curved to help direct the lead inside the heart. And you're going to see how we keep the lead from moving inside the heart. There's a little screw on the end. And that's going to be deployed. So that there's the lead, and that's the end of the lead. And there's the very tip of it. And the lead is floppy. And that's why it is easy to place these inside the heart. And they just simply move on the inside of the heart with the heart beat. But to place them inside the patient, we need to, in, to make a wire that is curved such that it will gain access to the chambers that we want to place the lead into. And so we make a special curve. And then we'll put that wire inside the lead to help direct it inside the patient's vessels. You can see now that the lead is curved on the end. That's a little clip, and that will be placed around the end opposite from the tip where the screw comes out. And you can see that that is being twirled now, and that will cause the little screw to come out of the end of the lead. And when the lead is actually inside the heart, that's what the physicians will do to have the lead grab some of the tissue on the inside of the heart so that it won't move. It'll stay in place. To gain access to the vessel under the collarbone, it's just like a regular IV. So a needle is used to access the vessel. Just like having a regular IV put in. And now we're going to look at the x-ray screen. That's the clavicle. The shadow of the needle is being pointed out underneath the clavicle. Through that, the wire is advanced into the vessel and then down into the heart. That's called a guide wire. Over the guide wire, a plastic sheath, just like an IV catheter, is going to be advanced over that wire. That's the plastic sheath. So it's just a little bit bigger, maybe three or four times bigger than a normal IV catheter. So it's being advanced over the wire. That'll keep access to the blood vessel. Now the guide wire is removed. The sheath remains in place, and there comes the defibrillator lead. It's going to be pushed through that catheter, and it's going to be brought down into the right atrium, now advanced down to the bottom of the right ventricle. At the very tip, you'll see that that screw is going to be deployed, and that's what will keep that catheter in place. And there's the little screw that's been advanced to keep it from moving. And that's what the lead looks like now that it's been placed inside the heart. Here's the pulse generator. And it needs to be connected now up to the leads. It's connected by placing the lead inside some portals, and then we use a wrench to secure the leads inside what we call the header block, which is the top of the pulse generator. And this is what the lead looks like now that it's been implanted and connected to the pulse generator, which has been placed inside that pocket. <laughs>
And you can see on the x-ray where the leads are connected to the top of the generator. And if you have an x-ray, that's exactly what a device would look like. Now, we're looking at the rhythm screen. So this is a nice normal beat. We need to make sure that the device is going to actually work for the patient. So we actually stir up a little bit of a fast heart rhythm. And with the patient sound asleep so they won't feel anything at all abnormal, we let the device go ahead and shock the patient out of a fast rhythm and restore normal rhythm. That assures us that all the connections to the device are proper. And there's the shock de being delivered, and the patient's rhythm is restored back to normal. That probably seems surprising that we could actually purposely put somebody into one of those abnormal rhythms. But you see, that rhythm is easily treatable as long as you can shock it. It's time that makes patients not survive that rhythm. But a few seconds of that rhythm is not an issue for a patient. So now the whole procedure is being finished up. The incision is closed. Nothing is going to be seen on the outside of the patient's body whatsoever. So that's an implantable cardioverter defibrillator, five minutes from an hour and a half. So back to our patient. So the patient did well until 2008, when he was admitted to the hospital with worsening heart failure symptoms. The options at the time were to see if any of his medication therapy could be maximized or to consider something called cardiac resynchronization therapy. Now, what is that? Well, a lot of heart failure patients have what we call dyssynchrony. That is, the heart is not moving the way it should be. What we'd like to see is that the septum and the lateral wall of the left ventricle come in together at the same time, but often it doesn't. The septum comes in first, followed by the lateral wall. And when it's dyssynchronous like that, cardiac function can be worsened. We'd like to see it come in together. So what's the fix? The fix is something called CRT, or cardiac resynchronization therapy. Not all heart failure patients have dyssynchrony, and therefore not all are candidates for this procedure. So how do we get rid of this dyssynchrony? Well, we can electrically stimulate the heart, or pace it, from both sides of the left ventricle. That is, we take over the heart, electrically speaking. How do we do that? Well, I've shown you how we can put pacemakers inside the heart, or ICD leads that also function as pacemakers. So we can do that. But how do we get over to the left side of the heart to cause that side to contract? So here would be our pacemaker or ICD lead in the right side of the heart. To get to the left side of the heart, we have to be a little sneaky, because we can't put a lead actually in the left ventricle. That's the side of the heart that pumps out to important organs, such as your brain. So if a blood clot were, for instance, to form in that lead, that would be a bad thing. A patient could have a stroke. But there's an entrance to a vein in the right atrium, and then that vessel snakes around behind the heart and then gives off branches on the outside of the heart. So if we can get into that vessel with a pacemaker lead, we can actually then snake it around and land on the outside of the heart on the lateral wall or the outside of the left ventricle with a standard little pacemaker leads. And then we can stimulate the heart Again, we're going to use the pacemaker in a novel way. This patient doesn't have to have a slow heart rate. We're just going to beat out his own electrical system and cause the two sides of that heart to come in and reverse that dyssynchrony. To do that, we use dye to fill the vessels of that special vein called the coronary sinus. And then we implant all of the leads that we need to perform this particular therapy. So here's a lead in the right atrium, one in this special vessel coming behind the heart, and one in the bottom of the right ventricle. And then we pace between these two leads. So here's an x-ray of somebody who has a CRT. In this case, it's implanted from the right side. Here's the lead that snakes beside, behind the heart. And it lands over here on the lateral wall of the ventricle. Here's the lead that's in the right ventricle. Comes up. And then is plugged into the pulse generator. So if the lead has that special coil on it, this device can perform all functions. It can pace for a patient with a slow heartbeat, it can shock for a patient for a fast heartbeat, and it can provide this resynchronizing pacing kind of therapy. Now, echocardiograms are often an interesting way to look at patients' motion of the heart. This is an echocardiogram. This is the heart upside down. This is the left ventricle. Over here is the right ventricle. So this would be the feet. The patient's head is up here. So this echocardiogram is going to show you how the function of this heart is prior to CRT therapy. And you can kind of see that those walls aren't coming in together. If you look at the septum versus the lateral wall, they're not synchronous at all. After CRT therapy, 
you can probably appreciate how those two sides are coming in together. And the whole size of that ventricle has actually shrunk down. That's going to translate into an improvement for this patient. So how does CRT help the failing heart? It improves symptoms. It improves the ejection fraction. Keeps the patient out of the hospital for heart failure decompensation. That's a really important benefit of the device. Gives them better exercise tolerance. But what about survival? And we're always interested in, does the device actually make patients live longer? Well, to do that, you have to do a randomized clinical trial. So you've seen curves like this. Now you're probably getting used to this. So this is what we do for CRT also. We look at this and we ask ourselves, well, if we implant a CRT into patients, and in this particular study called CARIHF, which was done in Europe, 813 patients with both an ischemic and a non-ischemic cause of heart failure with very advanced heart failure symptoms, class three and four, were randomized to receive CRT therapy or just good medical heart failure therapy. EF cutoff was 35%, and the QRS complex had to show evidence of delayed conduction through the heart or dyssynchrony. And what did we find? Well, this is how many patients survived over the course of time of the trial? The patients who had CRT had better survival compared to the patients with medical therapy only. And in fact, they had a 36% reduction in all-cause mortality. The benefit in this trial, because this was just a CRT pacemaker not combined with a defibrillator, was actually very interesting. The benefit was predominantly to decrease heart failure death, but that in turn decreases the risk of sudden cardiac arrest if the heart functions better. But if you combine CRT pacing with an ICD lead and an ICD generator, then you've got all forms of therapy. And these devices then address both of the primary causes of death in advanced heart failure. So in summary, for devices that address the electrical problems of patients with heart failure, implantable cardioverted defibrillators are indicated for secondary prevention, that is survivors of sudden cardiac arrest. They're indicated for primary prevention of sudden cardiac arrest in patients with moderate heart failure. Cardiac resynchronization therapy, CRT pacemakers, or when combined with a defibrillator, CRT-D, are indicated for patients with more advanced heart failure. And recently, some very exciting trials have been completed that have actually examined the use of CRT defibrillators in patients earlier on in the course of their heart failure to see if that would benefit and improve survival. So at this point, we have a surprise for you all. I gave you our case history of our patient, and we actually have our patient with us today. So we're going to actually call Mr. Rodney Garka to come on up. And we're going to ask him some questions. First of all, thanks so much for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. It's, it's been uh, quite fascinating for me to actually see this as well so was it difficult no not at all not at all um, I suppose as a patient you don't often know exactly what everything is going on uh, and so actually watching this tonight it's really helped explain a lot of it well you had a cardiac arrest in 2004 yes can you remember anything about what happened to you on that day? No, I can't. In fact, I do not remember anything for the two weeks prior to that day. Uh, no memory whatsoever of it. Um, I was very fortunate in that I worked at Everett Community College, um, which has an outstanding nursing program, and which is only about five blocks away from uh, Everett General Hospital. Um, when the event occurred, uh, a student actually came in and saw me on the floor. Goodness. Um, yes. Uh, but across the hallway were two, two nursing school students who, it was the end of the spring quarter, and they were actually graduating from their nursing program that night, and I like to say that I gave them their final. <laughs> uh, they performed CPR until the uh, ambulance arrived, which I was told was under three minutes because of how close it was. And at that point, they started with the electrical um, defibrillations. So you survived that, you woke up, and you received an implantable cardioverted defibrillator. Yes. 
And did you ever have a shock from that device? Yes, I did. Um, the first time that it actually happened, I was taking a shower. Oh. Um, and <laughs> Must have been surprising. As it happened, I wondered who reached around and punched me. Um, I've never actually, once they've shocked me, I've never passed out. Um, but it was, it was a shock. <laughs> um, and it felt like somebody punched me very hard in the chest. Um, at that point, of course, we contacted them and went on in to find out why. Um, and it was a necessary shock. So the years went on, and for a while you did well. And yes. then your heart failure started to become worse. Yes. So your single ICD was then changed out with leads added so that it could be a combination device for cardiac resynchronization therapy and a defibrillator, correct? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And did you feel better initially after that was implanted? I did. Um, uh, some friends and I, it wasn't too long after that, friends and I uh, made the trip down to Disney World in Orlando, and we spent four days there walking around. And as a doctor later asked me, okay, were you walking or were you in one of those carts? And I know my buddies would not let me get one of those carts if I wanted to anyway. So it was, um, it was very successful. It kept me um, quite, quite um, a bit of energy. Would you have been able to walk around Disneyland in those weeks or months prior to having the upgrade to the CRT? No, not at all. Um, n not long before that, uh, my girlfriend and I had uh, gone to a Bite of Edmonds event, and we had to park about four or five blocks away, um, about every block to maybe a block and a half. I was having to stop to actually catch my breath at that point. So that was a real dramatic change Very just dramatic. with CRT therapy. Yes. So you definitely benefited from electrical devices Absolutely. to help your heart. <laughs> Dr. Stampino-Terry, do you have any other questions? You benefited from medicines, too. We will point that out. Absolutely, absolutely. I've got to give myself some credit here. I am on a regimen of medicines, thank you very much. And um, those have been successful um, in keeping me mainlined as to where I should be. And, and I'll point out that Rodney actually has a, a familial cardiomyopathy. His mother, I followed his mother first for her cardiomyopathy. And... Um, and you then came to me after your cardiac arrest. <laughs> yeah. Um, they suggested that I go ahead and start coming down to the University of Washington instead of being seen through the uh, Everett Clinic um, due to the fact that it was familial and I could actually get more uh, therapies down here. Thank you. Thank you.